Section 4.3 is patterns in nonlinear functions. I can identify and represent patterns that describe nonlinear functions. Just like linear functions, nonlinear functions can be represented using words, tables, sets of ordered pairs, and graphs. A nonlinear function is a function whose graph is not a line or part of a line. Non means no linear line, so not a line. Uh, take note here on page 246 as uh, a concept summary between linear and nonlinear functions. So we talked about linear functions in section 4.2. They're a function whose graph is a non-vertical line or part of a non-vertical line. So we can draw those with a straight edge. Uh, we may not connect all the pieces, uh, but we still get the same um, relationship. Nonlinear functions are things like these bottom three. They're curvy. They're things that have points, and we have to turn our straight edge, for example. Um, this is uh, like a quadratic, y equals x squared. It's a parabola. Middle one is like y equals x cubed, for example. And the last one's kind of like an absolute value. Um, we'll talk about those later as the year goes on. But the big thing to know right now is that they are nonlinear. Uh, we cannot draw them with just one straight line. Example one is classifying functions as either linear or nonlinear. The area A in square inches of a pizza is a function of its radius R in inches. The cost C in dollars of the sauce for a pizza is a function of the weight W in ounces of the sauce used. Graph these functions shown below. Is each graph linear or nonlinear? So the first one here is pizza area. If we look here, we have a radius r in inches and an area a in inches squared. We have to figure out which one's independent, which one's dependent. Well, our area depends on what our radius is, which means r is independent, it's our input, and area is dependent, it's our output. So, when I label these, uh, remember our inputs and independent always go on the bottom. And our dependent outputs always go on the side, which here is area. Uh, it's pretty easy to figure out what I'm going to make my scale for uh, radius. Um, they go up by twos, but I only need to go by ten. So you can either go by 2 or go by 1, since 1 will fit here, which is what I'm going to do. I want to spread my data out the best that I can, um, so I really get a good picture of what's going on. So since 10 fits, um, I'm going to go by 1s. If I look here, though, for my area, I go all the way up to 314. So I can't just go by 1s, um, can't go by 2s. I need to figure out what I'm going to go by. So I take... Uh, how far I need to go, which is at least 314. I divide by how many places I have. Here I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And when I do that, I get 26.18. Uh, we don't necessarily probably want to count by 26.18s, so it has to be at least that much because we have to cover that whole ground. Here, I'm going to go up to 30s. They're fairly easy to count with, and we can approximate fairly well with them. So I'm going to count by 30s. And now we can graph our points. Uh, for a radius of 2, my area is 12.57, so just under halfway in between there. With a radius of 4, my area is 50.27. So a uh, little over two-thirds the way. Oh, I need 4. Sorry. For 6, uh, 113. So almost to 120. 8 gives me 201. And 10 takes me all the way to 314, almost halfway in between there. And if I try and connect these with a straight edge, 
uh, I can't. So um, I could have zero radius, zero area. I also, if you think about it in terms of pizza, um, when you roll out the dough, for example, we can have pieces in between there. It doesn't just magically like glitch to the next um, inch. So we can connect these. We just can't connect them with a straight edge. This is a curve. Missed it there. And since it's curved, this is going to be non linear. Our second one here is sauce cost. Uh, weight and cost there, the relationship between them is that cost depends on weight. How much of it we use um, determines how much it costs. So since weight is independent, it's our input, it goes on the bottom. And since cost is dependent, it goes on the side. Uh, if I look here, uh, my weight is the same, so still I'm going to go up by um, once. And as far as my uh, cost goes, here if I look every time, I go up by 0.8. Otherwise, I can take that 4 um, that I need to go by, divide by 14, go up and go by 40 cents as well. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. Go up by the 80 cents that it goes up by every time. So $1.60, 240 And again, normally this would be kind of a weird um, amount to go by, but since that's what my change is every time here, I can use that as my scale. So my points here, I have two eighty cents, uh, four dollar sixty, six two forty, eight three twenty, and ten four dollars. And if I use zero, it'd be zero. And we can continue this pattern. Um, and if we wanted to, we could use a straight edge to connect those dots. Which means this is linear. Because they go up by the same amount every time, it is linear. We can connect them with a straight edge. Now the table below shows the fraction A of the original area of a piece of paper that remains after the paper has been cut in half n times. Graph the function represented by the table. Is the function linear or nonlinear? So here, uh, this graph is going to show our cutting paper situation. The number of cuts and the fraction of the area remaining, well the area depends on the number of cuts. Which means area is or uh, the number of cuts is my input, and since area depends, it's my output. My dependent it goes on the side. Uh, my number of cuts are pretty straightforward as far as the scale goes. They go up by ones every time. Um, but my fraction of original area remaining here. I only need to get to a half, so I want to spread my data out the best that I can. And if I look, my smallest unit is 1 16th. So I can count by 16th. 1 16th, 2 16th, 3 16th, 4 16th. The 16th part is just kind of like a label at this point. You can think about it in terms of our numerators going up by 1. And every time we still have that 16th. Now we can reduce some of these. Uh, 2 16th is the same as 1 8th. 4 16th is 1 4th. 6 is 3 8th. And 8 16th is a half. So when I go to plot my points, uh, with an input of 1, I output a half. With an input of 2, I output a quarter. 
with an input of 3, I output an eighth, and an input of 4, I output a sixteenth. And if I look here, uh, I cannot continue, or sorry, I cannot draw uh, a line connecting these because I can't have partial cuts. Uh, and if I do, it doesn't change the area. Uh, but what I can do is put an arrow. If we have more cuts, for example, we have less paper. Um, and if we see here, this is not in a straight line. Our change is not the same every time. So this is non-linear. Example two is representing patterns in nonlinear functions. The table shows the total number of blocks in each figure below as a function of the number of blocks on one edge. What is the pattern we can use to complete the table? Represent the um, relationship using words, an equation, and a graph. So here I have one block on the edge, which means on all of my edges I only have one. So I have one total block. For two, I have two wide and two deep and two tall, which gives me a total of eight. For three, I have three wide, three deep, three tall, which gives me a total of 27. And I get those by multiplying my dimensions together. So for four, I'd have four wide, four deep, four tall. I multiply those together and get 64. For five, I'd have five wide, five deep, and five tall, which gives me 125. So my ordered pairs would be 464 and 5125. Um, so the relationship using words. Uh, in words, we can say the total number of blocks is found by taking the number of blocks on an edge times itself three times. Once for the width, once for depth, and once for height. And again, uh, just like with last section, you could have put those words in a lot of different ways um, and still gotten to the same spot. So now, here we said that we can take the number of blocks on an edge, one, times itself for width, depth, and height. Here I took two times two times two. 3 times 3 times 3 to get to 27, width, depth, height, and width, depth, height. So our total number of blocks, y, equals the thing that stayed the same here every time is that we multiplied them times themselves three times, times themselves three times, times themselves three times. And when we're talking about repeated multiplication, we use um, exponents. And here, the amount of times our base was multiplied by itself was always 3. That stays the same. So in my equation, that 3 is my exponent. The part that changed every time was my base. Here it was 1. Here it was 2. Here it was 3. And each time, it matched my number of blocks on an edge, x. So we can take our base times itself three times to get to our total number of blocks, um, and that base depends on the blocks on an edge. Now, as far as the graph goes, uh, the number of blocks on the edge is my input. It goes on the bottom. Total blocks is my output. It goes on the side. Uh, my number of blocks on an edge just went up by one, so I just went one, two, three, four, five. My total blocks I needed to get to 125, I had 12 spots. So when I divided, I got just over 10. So I went by 10, and I know my last one's gonna be a little bit over my graph, but it's not gonna be all the way to that next line, so that's okay. Uh, so here, I have one, one, so just a little bit above, two, eight, almost a 10, 327, 464 and 5125. And I can't connect them here because I can't have partial blocks. And we see that this is, in fact, nonlinear. Uh, so there are some different ways that we can represent this pattern. We used a table, words, equation, and a graph. And I will, and that's what uh, the 4 and 5 would look like. And I'll finish in another video.